Good evening and welcome to the programme where you can help cut crime. Our cases tonight range right across the country from Plymouth to Aberdeen and our reconstructions include the mammoth bank raid that brought Preston Town Centre to a standstill. Here's a number if you recognise a suspect or spot a clue and here are the detectives waiting to take your call. People often ask us how many Crime Watch cases are solved as a result of viewers' calls. We'll be reporting on the progress since last month's programme in a moment, but in the four years since Crime Watch began, 178 people have now been arrested as a direct result of Crime Watch information. And of those, 108 have so far been convicted. The majority of these convictions are for the most serious crimes, of course, that the police have to deal with. Our first case is one that's already made the headlines, and not surprisingly. It brought a town centre to a standstill, involved a kidnapping and a siege and the theft of over half a million pounds. A family was terrorised, though as you'll see they showed remarkable courage. Seven weeks ago today, on Thursday the 15th of September, police were called to Fishergate in the heart of Preston when the National Westminster Bank there failed to open. They knew that the staff were in there and when they found that they couldn't communicate with them they brought in marksmen they cleared the area, and for three hours, they lay in wait. But the robbers had already fled. Our reconstruction begins the evening before the raid as the bank manager, Roger Ball, left work. He noticed that, though it was a staff car park, someone had left a red Ford Escort van beside his car. One word, I'll blow your head off. What are you, okay, you Mr. Ball? Yes, yes, sir. Are you the senior manager of the NatWest Bank? Yes, the top man. Yes, yes, sir. So what? It's loaded, right? Over to the van. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Okay, it's down, right? Down. One word. Right here. This pump was recovered by the police and was found to be faulty. But when the car was later found, the tyre was well inflated. So this blue Sierra must have been taken to a garage. Morecambe Illuminations, 30 miles from Preston. Despite the blindfold, Roger realised he was being driven to a public car park beside Morecambe Golf Course. It's not far from his home. The red van and another car, perhaps his own Sierra, stayed here for over half an hour. By now, his family would expect him to be home. Haven't you had enough? Dad's late. I'm glad we didn't have to wait for him to come home before we had our tea. Yes, he's late. Right, stand up. OK, come over to the left. Are you getting in a passenger seat if you want? Come on. Come on, sit down in the front seat. Mind your head. In you go. And the legs. In you go. Police have reason to believe that Roger was next driven here to Sandside Caravan Site at Bolton Le Sands, just north of Morecambe. Were you here on Wednesday the 14th? There's an unusual old fashioned payphone. In. Mrs. Ball? Yes. Jean, it's me. Roger. Now, don't panic, love. Stay calm. Now, don't what? ring the police. What? Just what? listen to I me. Mean, what, what, what's going on? Do exactly as I say. Jean was told to open the door to the patio. As you told and you won't get hurt, all right? I'm going to stay nice and calm till your husband gets home. All right, come in. 
Roger. Dad. Keith, Vanessa, are you both all right? right. Yes. Stop. Sit down. Everything OK? Yeah. Now, we're going to be here till about 4 o'clock this morning, so we might as well make ourselves nice and comfortable. And you don't do anything stupid, and you do what you're told, everybody's going to be fine. No one will get hurt. I, uh, I don't suppose the chance of a cup of tea is a Mrs. Ball. with 200 mile an hour winds has hit Mexico and is heading for Texas. Leaving us well alone. That's the line of... I had a, a poor upbringing, but I didn't resort to crime. Mom! Well, it's absolutely true. Why don't you do have easy money just because you think you have the right to do that? You're underprivileged and all that. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. One of the intruders stole both Rogers and Jean's cash cards and from bank records, it's known he took them to this dispenser on the front at Morecambe. It was 10 o'clock. Might you have seen him? Now, Rog, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do in the bank. Roger was astonished to be told that the gang could get into the locked bank without him. But they needed his help to persuade his colleagues to open up the vault. If he didn't cooperate, his wife and daughter would be killed. What happened next, they all found terrifying. All right. They were driven off, locked in darkness, in Jean's silver Ford Orion and in Roger's blue Sierra. They finished up beside the bank in a deserted shop. Jean and Vanessa, blindfolded, had no idea oh. where they were. Roger guessed roughly where he was, but he didn't know his wife and daughter were in the room below him. Vanessa. Roger had been instructed to go to work to round up all his staff and tell them to cooperate. Now, there's nothing, nothing you can do about it. No alarms, nothing. They've got Jean and Vanessa. There's a, there's a robber already in the bank and there's one outside. I must ask you, please, stay very, very... Right, quiet. you! Don't move! Do exactly as you're told. Stay where you are. If I get caught, I get 20 years. If I take one of you with me, I get another five. Roger, let him in. OK, who you got, Rob? Everybody all right, you say calm. Wait, who's got the keys to the fort? Come on, the keys for the vault! Vault, he needs vault, vault, he wants the keys for the vault. Have. Have. Okay, have. over here, come on! Come on, hurry up! Come on, come on, make a move! Come on, fast! At just after half past nine, two workmen arrived for a routine check on the alarms. Strange, the bank's still shut. I just need to bounce it to the space. Right, Andy. He saw a silver Orion backing up the passageway beside the bank. When he walked past the Orion to find a parking space, he saw a man loading bags from the side door of the bank into the boot of the car. All of you, come on, come on, come on. into the fault, come on. Quickly, keep moving, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Meanwhile, at the front, a crowd of customers had gathered. The bank was now 15 minutes late in opening. This is Garden Street. All right, come on. Come on. This woman almost certainly heard the robbers exchanging cars. The Silver Orion was later found abandoned in Preston Station car park. The end of Garden Street opens out towards the station. Usually, the way is blocked by bollards. Sometime earlier that morning, they'd been removed. Mr. Warms, it must be said that no gratuitous violence was used, but it was a miracle. No one had a heart attack. There were so many people involved. Nat West, so insistent this isn't going to happen again, 
one of their staff kidnapped like this. They've offered the monumental reward, £50,000, which is a really big one by yes. UK standards. It's the largest reward that I'm aware of, certainly in the north of England. And in addition to that, it's 10% of the proceeds recovered will be paid to anyone with information leading to the arrest of the person responsible. OK, now what do we know about the people? We've got a video fit of one of them. That was the chap who was seen putting money into the boot of the car. Describe him to us, yeah. can you? He is offender number three, uh, and as you say, he, he took the money out of the bank and into the boot of the Orion. He's described as tan white male, five foot nine, he's got black short hair, he's wearing a moustache and wearing smart light brown suit. And suspects one and two, they were um, fairly similar. They were fairly small, weren't they? Five foot seven or so? Yes, they're thought to be uh, about 25 years of age, less than five foot seven. OK, one of them had a speech defect. I don't know if, if you noticed, uh, he, he said that, um, White, who's got the keys to the fault? As though he can't say uh, R in right and he can't say V in vault. That's right. It's an impediment which is thought to affect the Vs and the Rs. But they do have what is described as soft Merseyside accents. Now, this foot pump is important. You need to find anyone at all who's ever bought a foot pump like this from Holford's that hasn't worked. That's right. it back. These were made by Cameron Price in Birmingham uh, from December, uh, November 1987. Um, it's sold only through the Holford uh, retailer's shops. Uh, it's known to be defective. It has been returned by a legitimate purchaser and then subsequently stolen. So if you were a legitimate purchaser of a Halford foot pump that didn't work after that period in 87, end of 87, and took it back to a Halford shop, please give us a call. The Red Fort Escort van We've got a picture of it here. It's remarkably clean. It looks as though it's been washed prior to the robbery or kept in a garage. Now, that's distinctive. Tell us why people might remember having seen that. It, it's red in colour. It's got a B registration on a five-year-old vehicle. It's got a black roof rack, as you can see, and a hole has been punched into the side, which, when we found it, was covered by adhesive tape. Right, that little hole, that spy hole that they cut in, is, is perhaps something that somebody might have, might have noticed in it. There's also a, a white van. Now, tell us the significance of that. Yes, this white van with shower power on the side was seen about 25 minutes past six on the morning of the robbery itself in uh, the Asda car park, which is at the bottom of Garden Street, possibly only about 10 yards away from where the bollards were removed from. Right, it's, it's called a, a Luton-type van. We're not interested in people telling us about shower power. We know that's of no relationship to, to the vehicle. Yes. There was a lot of heavy money stolen. Two and a half hundredweight was taken in coins, um, like two and a half sacks of cement. Right. 11,000 pounds in pound and 50 pence pieces uh, amounts to two and a half hundredweight, and that is a lot of money, right. a lot of weight. Right. Well, if you can help recover any of the money, there's a big reward. If you can help convict any of the men, there's a huge reward. If you've any information, here's the number to ring, 01811 Or you can call Preston Police Direct on 0772 203 203. That's 0772, that's the code for Preston, 203 203. Well, calls from last month's programme led to new lines of inquiry on most of our cases, and many of those are still being pursued. In Hull, detectives are working their way through information from more than 200 viewers who rang about the murder of driving instructor Keith Slater, who was stabbed on his own doorstep. We've still not heard from the woman who was seen with Keith in the National Pub. But two weeks ago, a man rang Hessel Police Station near Hull and asked to speak to Detective Superintendent Barry Lilly. He seemed to know details of the murder, but refused to give his name because he was frightened. Now, police have appealed in the press today and they're now asking again for that man to ring back. So if that was you, and if you are watching tonight, please call us in the studio or you can ring the incident room at Hull. And it's 0482 501 222. That's 0482 501 2. In Leeds, detectives were overwhelmed with information about a con man, a Jeff Capes look-alike, who was stealing old people's savings. They now have new lines of inquiry. At least the programme may have deterred the conman for a time. In one day alone, in fact, the day before the evening of the programme, he committed ten offences. In the four weeks since then, not one has been reported. The two callers gave the same name as a suspect for the murder of Abdur Rashid. Abdur was a religious teacher who lived in Whitechapel in East London. And detectives are convinced that those two people can help them find the killer. They've asked us to appeal to them to call again. There are some more details they need, and they're promising that those callers will have the utmost discretion. Here's the number of the studio again. It's 01811 We're live, of course, so you can call now. Or you can call Southgate Police Station on 01803 That's 01803 Now to Photocall, a part of Crime Watch which 
many viewers are able to help with since we have faces and sometimes even names. Of course, what detectives need to hear from you now is whether you recognize these people, and if so, where are they now? Here's Superintendent David Hatcher. First, we need your help to find this man. He's robbed eight building societies across central London since January and escaped with over £12,500. He almost always wears the same beige jacket and wax cotton barber type hat and takes great care to avoid the security cameras. But on the 1st of September, he walked into a branch of the National and Provincial Building Society in southwest London and the camera caught him face on. Take a closer look at him. He's described as being 25 to 35 years old, of slim build, with blue eyes, short fair hair, and a wispy fair moustache. This is what that jacket and hat might look like in colour. And he always carries a millet's carrier bag, which conceals a gun. Take a look at him again. If you know who he is or where he is, call us now. Grampian police would like to speak to this woman, Alison Anders. She may have information about an attempted fraud at an Aberdeen-based oil company. The fraud involved an attempt to divert a cheque for over £23 million into a bank account abroad. Alison Anders has now left her flat in Claremont Street, Aberdeen, and her job. She's 30, 5 foot 4 inches tall, well built, with short dark hair, and is usually tanned. She's from Kent and has an English accent. If you've seen her, call us now. Next, do you recognise these two men? In September, they went into a plant hire shop in Biggleswade, Bedfordshire. Using false details and a stolen driving licence in the name of P. Rickson, they hired a Cayman rotovator for the day. They loaded the rotovator, valued at over £3,000, into a white minibus, in which there was a third man in his twenties with brown hair. The hire equipment was not returned. The hirer is in his forties, five foot eight inches tall and wearing tinted spectacles. His accomplice is 30 years old, five foot ten inches tall and heavily built. If you know them or where they are now, call us. Finally, colleagues in Kent and Essex would like to speak to this man, Leslie Marcus Baptiste. We believe he may have important information about the theft of three cheques from the New Inn Hotel in Dagenham, Essex. Newham Borough Council sent cheques totalling over £33,000 to the hotel to cover the cost of housing homeless people. The cheques never got to the hotel owner, but were later used to open bank accounts in Gravesend and Rochester in Kent. The money was then withdrawn. Baptiste is 33 years old, of mixed race and six feet tall. When he was last seen, he had short black curly hair and a moustache. If you know the whereabouts of Mr Baptiste or any of our other photo call faces, then ring us now. And you can see the number here, it's 01811 8055, 01811 8055. We're just getting information through at the moment that we've had a caller who already believes that they know who one of the robbers is and has given police a name, so that one's being followed up at the moment. Our next case is the murder of Michael Williams, ten weeks ago. He was last seen alive on the Friday evening before the August bank holiday weekend. His body was found early next morning in Highgate Wood in North London, close to where he lived. But police need to know where he went and what happened to him during the course of that night. Michael was 43, he'd lived in Highgate all his life and he was an active member of the local church. He'd been married for 18 years and had a two-year-old daughter. Michael was always keen to spend as much time as he could with her and worked flexi hours and often came home early to look after her. Our reconstruction begins in Pimlico in South London where Michael worked. He was employed by the Home Office here at Horse Ferry House where he'd helped set up the police national computer. Ironically, the very system which is now being used to help track down whoever killed him. It's Friday the 26th of August. Hello. Hello, it's me. I just wondered how late you'd be tonight. Look, I'll work for another hour or so. Should be home about eight. OK, I'll put Marie to bed then. We'll uh, see you later. Michael had been under a lot of pressure at work and for the past week he'd been staying late every evening to finish a particular project. We're off to the pavias for a few drinks, coming? Oh, lucky for some. No, I've still got work to do. Oh, come on, you've got three whole days off. Why not? I'll wait outside. See you in a while.
So instead of going straight home that night, he came here to the Pavia's Arms in Pimlico. Let's do a bit of music. Do a bit in the garden. Yeah. Would you like another drink? drink? No, thank you. No, you sure? Not for me either, thank you. Oh, God, is that the time? No, I said I'd be home at eight ish. Yeah, it's about time to go. So you're going on the tube? Yep. Yeah, I'll come. You coming? Bye, all. See you next week. Yeah, you too. Bye. Right, well, this is where I change. So, uh, see you, Michael. Have a nice weekend. That was the last time anyone he knew saw him alive. From now, we can only speculate about where Michael went next. If he'd taken his usual journey home, he'd have continued on the Victoria Line as far as Warren Street or Euston, where he would have changed onto the Northern Line. By then, it would have been about a quarter to midnight. From here, he'd get on the Northern Line to Highgate. But it's by no means certain that he did take his usual route home that night. Perhaps he met someone along the way. Police need to talk to anyone who may have seen him. If he did come to Highgate Station, his walk home would have taken him past Highgate Wood. Or he may have gone one step further along the Northern Line to East Finchley, because someone who looked like Michael was seen there at about half past 12 by a ticket collector. Really? Which way to the Lewis? Toilets are closed here, Gov. Mm. If that was Michael, where did he go next? Was he planning to walk home from here? This is Highgate Wood, a popular spot even early in the mornings. Well, then, let's go home. It's the next day, Saturday morning. At about 20 to 8, a woman walking her dog saw something lying by the path leading to the wood. It was Michael Williams' body. He'd been killed by a single blow to the throat. Yankee Romeo from 559. Can you call the CID? I found a dead body in the alleyway off of Lanchester Road, N6. Police need to know whether he was killed there or whether his body was left there later. Several people who'd used the path even earlier that morning didn't see the body, so it's vital that more witnesses come forward to help work out what did happen. At six o'clock that morning, this man was walking his dog near the woods, past the spot where Michael's body was found. He saw nothing there, but then just round the corner, something odd happened. My dog's usually uh, quiet, and um, she saw this man standing over there, run at him, and uh, barked at him hysterically. The man was standing there, absolutely mobile, and looked as if he was hypnotised under the influence of something. He was not moving at all. It was absolutely unreal how the man stood there and um, did not react to my, to my dog who was attacking him and barking at him. Three quarters of an hour later, as the gates to the wood were being unlocked for the day, the strange man had gone. And just five minutes after that, there was still nothing seen by the path. So police believe it must have been between 7 o'clock and 7.40 that his body was put there. It may have been dumped from a car. And there's a postscript. This is the new Arjun Tandoori restaurant in Fry and Barnet Road in Southgate. The day after Michael's body was found, someone came into the restaurant and paid by credit card. Your bill, sir.
Well, that card, of course, belonged to Michael Williams. Peter Wilton, Michael had been robbed of all the property he had on him. Was robbery the motive, do you think? That certainly was one motive, but this case has sexual, homosexual connotations. He was a bisexual. It may well be that he met somebody and left somebody before he got attacked. I would like that person to come forward, or any person that was attacked uh, in the locality that hasn't reported it before. Will they please come forward? What description do you have of that strange man seen standing at 6 o'clock in the morning in Highgate Wood in some kind of trance? Yes, he's never been identified. Um, he's six foot tall, white man, slim build, blondish brown hair, um, with a beard of the same colouring. Complete mystery, that. Whoever murdered Michael, was he a karate expert? Could well be. We've spoken to um, several karate experts, and they say it would take several years of experience to deliver a blow such as that, because it was a lot of force used to Michael Williams' throat. So a clue might lie there. Yes. Now you need to trace whoever used Michael's access card at the new Arj Arjun Tandoori restaurant, if only to eliminate him from your inquiries. Yes, I would like them to come forward, because they may well not have been the person that attacked Michael Williams. They may have got the card by buying it, finding it, um, so I would like them to come forward. It may well be that other people were there whilst they used it as well, so they might know something about it. That will obviously save you hundreds of, of man-hours of work. Um, do you promise him discretion if yes, you come forward? Yes, most certainly. Yes, we're confidential. Right. Now, the main hope must be to trace some of Michael's property, all in a black and white carrier bag with ID on it. That's right. Um, if we just run through the property very quickly, there was a radio pager yes. called a Voda page. Yes. That may have been discarded somewhere, so that could I be an important clue if anybody finds that. There was a computer manual. Yes, his own There was computer. his home office pass. That's right. And also a signet ring with his initials on. We don't have that, of course. And a distinctive Rolex watch. Could you tell me about that? Yes, uh, it was made for him about 17 years ago. And the peculiar thing about it is that... Uh, there are clasps around the face of the watch, holding the face of the watch, so it is quite distinctive. Right, so we're looking for all those items of property. If you were in Highgate Woods early that Saturday morning, please call us, even if you don't actually think you saw anything of interest. And if there's anything you can add to what police know of where Michael was that Friday night, Saturday morning, again, please call. The number here in the studio, as always, is 01811 8055 or ring the incident room direct and that is 01803 3311. It's 01803 3311. We've had a large volume of calls already this evening with some very promising uh, calls coming in. On the Preston robbery, uh, a number of callers have rung in to suggest named persons and leads like that are being followed up at the, at the moment. Police are out checking on individuals, in fact, right now. I'm afraid to call a number of, again, very promising leads. The barber hat robber, remember the chap who wore that particularly odd piece of, or a uh, distinctive piece of headgear. Police have been given uh, a strong lead there. They don't want to say, to say more at the moment. Uh, on the plant hire fraudsters, police are checking out a named person at the moment. And on Leslie Baptiste, police are checking out an address which has been named by two callers. More news now of progress on previous cases. One person was arrested almost as soon as last month's programme came off the air. More than 100 viewers thought that they recognised a young woman who was wanted in connection with some crimes against an elderly man. Seven of those callers gave an address in Oxford and a woman found near there has since been charged with robbery and with burglary. On the murder of Graham Williamson in Bournemouth, Crime Watch viewers saved police wasting hundreds of man-hours trying to trace the belt that the killer had left behind. Police had thought the belt was handmade and therefore very distinctive. Now we know that thousands of them were made around eight years ago, so the emphasis of the inquiry changed, and now, though not directly because of the programme, a man has been charged with murder. Well, now to uh, Incident Desk, where we invite the police to appeal to you directly. Tonight, Devon and Cornwall Force need help to solve the murder of a club steward. Lothian Police hope you might know the whereabouts of some exhibits from the Edinburgh Festival. And Northamptonshire Police are appealing for information on a really vicious attack during a burglary. Here's Superintendent David Hatcher again. First, that incident in Northampton. On Sunday the 18th of September, the owner of this office, Shackleton Contracts, went into work and found an intruder robbing the premises. The struggle followed in which the owner was attacked with this small hand axe, badly injuring his arm. The man then fled, leaving behind a number of items, including the axe. It had been owned by British Rail and has BR stamped on it. It has a blue head, this orange shank and black rubber handle. Now, the man's of mixed race, 20 to 25 years old, 5 foot 8 inches tall, with a full square face and black curly hair. 
He was wearing a blue anorak with grey on the shoulders and he had dark trousers and green gloves. In the struggle, the victim knocked the man's glasses off. We have them here and they show that he's short-sighted. This is what he would have looked like with them on. He also left behind this holdall with CB sports on it and red piping round the edges. And also this sharp personal stereo. If you know someone who used to own these items but who's lost them recently, please get in touch. At 9.30pm on Tuesday the 25th of October, just over a week ago, the body of a 16-year-old Vietnamese boy, Ho A Long, was found floating in the River Thames near the South Bank. He'd been strangled. He was last seen alive at 10pm the previous evening, leaving his home in North Peckham, London. But where did he go in the previous 24 hours? When he was found, he was wearing beige trousers and a black T-shirt with a spider motif on the front and back. But when he left home, he was wearing a brown leather flying jacket over these clothes and a pair of trainers. Where are the jacket and those trainers now? He hadn't been in the water for more than half an hour when he was found at 9.30pm, so if you were on the South Bank that Tuesday evening, the 25th, and saw anything suspicious, or if you have any information about Ho A Long, do, do ring us. In December last year, two rapes were committed in Colchester, Essex, and forensic evidence has proved that the same man was responsible. The victims, one of whom was only 16 years old, describe him as 5 foot 8 to 10 inches tall, of muscular build. He's about 20 to 25 years old, clean shaven and with a fresh complexion. His hairstyle is particularly distinctive. It's fair to blonde, very short at the sides, but longer and spiky on top. On the first occasion, he was wearing a beige padded jacket like this one and a triangular silver pendant, similar to this that may have been a St Christopher. And furthermore, on the 21st of September this year, a man attempted to rape a woman in Grey's Essex. Although we're not sure the cases are linked, the description of the attacker is remarkably similar. A witness saw a dark-coloured car driving off at speed. It may have been a hatchback with a small engine, possibly a Ford Fiesta. If you recognise any of these details, please let us know. The body of Ray Anstey was discovered on Thursday the 29th of September at the Pennycross Sports and Social Club in Plymouth. He was the steward of the club and was probably ambushed by the robbers as he locked up for the night. The murderers emptied the gaming machines and also took Mr Anstey's wallet. This is a replica. In it were some membership cards like these and a photograph of his eight-year-old daughter. Also missing is a lighter, a bunch of keys and an unusually large ring. It has a small stone in the corner and is nine carat gold with a sunburst design. Have you seen or been offered that ring? At about ten past midnight, a witness saw two men getting into a dark brown estate car, possibly a Mark III Cortina. We'd like to speak to those two men, or indeed anyone else who saw them. The Edinburgh Festival is a time when many artists exhibit their work. Sally Arnott rented a converted wash house in Abbey Mount near Holyrood House to show her sculptures. But sometime during the night of the 30th of August, thieves got in and stole 26 of her silver and bronze animal statues. These are from the same limited edition. The most valuable piece taken was a piglet like this, except the one stolen was in solid silver and valued at over £3,000. A silver version of this rascass fish was taken as well. That's worth a thousand pounds. All the statues were mounted on white marble bases, numbered and signed Sally Arnup. Now, Edinburgh police don't think that they'll have been melted down as their scrap value would be very little. They might well turn up in shops or collectors markets. Perhaps you've seen them. If so, we'd like to hear from you. A reminder once again of the number, it's 01811 That's 01811 8055. This is top quality leather. In fact, it feels like silk. It's made from skins like these, and the markings that you'll find on skins like these show that they come from a place called Gomshall Tanneries. Over the past two years, the firm has been subjected to a series of burglaries and to a robbery in which staff were threatened with a shotgun. We've reconstructed the latest of these raids. It took place about a month ago, and maybe you can help. Incidentally, the company have asked us to point out that they've now changed their security procedures. The film begins at Newlands Corner, which is just off the A25 in Surrey.
Walkers and picnickers are attracted to the rolling countryside that surrounds the Guildford to Dorking Road. Gomshall is on the main road. It's mentioned in the Doomsday Book. It's a picture postcard village where strangers are easily noticed. There's been a tannery here for over 500 years. During the Victorian period, Gomshall Tannery thrived and gradually the company developed a worldwide reputation for high-quality sheepskin leather. But now the company has been taken over and production has been transferred to other parts of the country. It's Friday the 2nd of September. On her way to work, this woman noticed a white van parked in Coal Kitchen Lane opposite the tannery gates. At lunchtime, two men entered the post office down the road and bought some sandwiches. Hello. You won't get a sunburn today, will you? Hmm. You won't get a suntan all week here. <laughs> the first witness was leaving the tannery late that afternoon when she noticed the men walking along the main road. Who were they and where had they been during the day? At about 6.30, the two were spotted wandering back towards the tannery gates. Another villager noticed one of them stop and walk a few paces back. It was a few minutes later that two men broke into the tannery. So as not to be discovered, they put a brand new crown padlock on the gates. The box van was spotted being driven in. It may have had a red logo on the front above the cab. They took only the best quality leather. One box was later found like this. The skins they stole had these distinctive gomshal stamps. The A shows their top quality. Hey, the thieves also stole two boxes of rare New Zealand leathers. They probably left at about 8.30 just before the security guards made their regular check. They made off with 56 boxes worth £82,000. There's a strong possibility that the Gomshall break-in may be linked to three earlier raids in south-east London. They all took place at this warehouse in Rotherhithe. It was also owned by Gomshall tanneries. In 1986, two men tricked their way in. Can I help you? Sorry to bother you, Chief. Yeah, we're from the uh, security company. Just come to do a routine check. Is that all right? All right. Just through there. Terrific. Won't keep you long. Thanks a lot. They tampered with the alarm system and later returned, broke in and escaped with top quality leather. Then, in July 1987, Again, only best quality leather was stolen. And in December 1987, as a legitimate customer came to the door... Hello, come Hello. Out. How are you? I'm fine. Get back! Get in the corner! And you stay over there! Again, they went straight for top quality hides. 
In total, Gomshal tanneries have lost well over a quarter of a million pounds worth of stock. We can presume that these are professionals. They probably come from London. They presumably have a, a receiver already set up because there's a huge quantity of, of leather that they've taken. Tell us what we know about the men. Yes, we have a description, um, which we've got a video fit here, of one of the men. He's six foot, late twenties. Um, his hair is dark brown and it's graying at the front. Now the witness states that that is more natural than streaked by a hairdresser. And the, the second male is also late twenties, but of a more muscular build with a moustache. OK, both wore tracksuit trousers and, and trainers in the Goms for Raid, though they probably discarded those. Where did the van come from? What do we know about it? We know that uh, it is a Luton bodied van, and we know that there is a, a red logo on the front over the cab, and also a red logo um, on the back door there. So obviously we'd like to know who um, may have hired that van or lent, if anyone lent it to anybody over that particular weekend. Leather experts will recognise this is very high quality leather. These markings on here, of course, again, they will have seen, although it's quite easy to rub this off to, to get rid of it, but obviously any leather merchants who've uh, got high quality leather like this might like to call us because there's a substantial reward. Yes, there is a reward of 10% uh, for any information uh, in this matter. And some of these skins are very distinctive. Very quickly, just explain what this yes. is, for example. This is called uh, the Contour Napper, and it is solely manufactured by the Gomshaw Tannery. Um, and it's very, very distinctive. distinctive. OK, well, here's the number if you can help, 01811-8055, 01811-8055. Or you can call Guildford Police, 0483 311 That's 0483, the code for Guildford, 31111. And just to update you on some more of the calls we've been receiving here in the studio and at incident rooms around the country, on the uh, theft of the plant hire, the Cayman Rotivator, detectives are at this moment on their way apparently to the address of a man who's been named by a number of callers. And on the Preston raid, nearly 20 callers have called in, all offering names. All those names are being checked out now as we speak. Uh, the detectives in the incident room describe the phones as being red hot, it says here. The officer in charge is anxious for one person who seemed to know a great deal about the robbery to call back. So please do call back. One caller believes he or she recognised the video fit and has given us a name. So I gather there are some lines free now if you'd find them busier earlier, so do keep trying. We'll give you all the local relevant numbers in a moment, and they're all on CFAX if you have that, on page 186. Or you can write to us on Crime Watch UK, BBC Television, London W12, 8QT. More information coming in right now. If you want to see what is happening as a result of these calls, please join us for Crime Watch Update. That's at 11.45 tonight. There's a further update on open air tomorrow morning. If you can't be around for either of those, do bear in mind we've compressed several months of crime into the last three quarters of an hour. Violence, I know we say it again and again, really is rarer than people seem to think. So don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night. Wow.